mean, if, if, you, if the exposure changes does. enough, does the exposure change enough for you to see the berg or not really? Uh, not at the moment. Uh, not at the moment. No. no. All right, no uh, worries. No, we'll, we'll have to look at our faces then. But it, it, that's fine. I think your faces will, will do for now. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously I'm James. Um, nice to okay. meet you guys in person, and thanks for taking part. So obviously I'm James. Uh, nice to meet you guys in person. Thanks for taking part. No worries. No, great to speak to you. And um, I guess we bearing in mind that uh, the connection is, is is a little bit tenuous. I guess we should. Bearing in mind that the connection is is a little bit tenuous. Well, it's, it's awesome. We could talk to you live at all from Antarctica, so this is fantastic. It, it is absolutely incredible. You're, you're quite right. Are we ready to start? Right? Okay, so are we on? I think you're live, actually. Okay, all right. Um, so, hello and welcome to this Hangout on Air hosted by Lonely Planet. Um, my name's James Kay, and I'm joined today by two people who are not going to forget their Christmas or New Year's Eve in a hurry. Um, Professor Chris Turney. And Dr. Andrew Peacock were part of a scientific Hi, research team aboard a ship that spent over a week trapped in the Antarctic ice. Um, the team were retracing the route of the explorer Douglas Mawson, who visited the continent over a century ago. And just first to start with you guys introducing yourselves and telling us a little bit about your role on the expedition. Well, my name is uh, Chris Turney. I'm leader of the Australasian Antarctic expedition. Um, as you said, it's a uh, it's a science expedition. We're following in the footsteps by the great Antarctic explorer and scientist, Douglas Mawson, but basically using uh, his data set that he collected, he was down here for two years, plus uh, other work that's been done since to look at the rate of change in this amazing environment. This is a major driver of a global climate ocean system, and uh, there are phenomenal changes taking place here, and we're going south with a large team to uh, investigate our change. Okay, who else was on board? And, uh, I'm Andrew Peacock. Okay. Who else was on board? Sorry, Andrew. Oh, um, alongside. Sorry, Andrew. Oh, sorry, that's no, all right. Well, Andrew here, obviously, who's the uh, expedition uh, medic and uh, photographer. But we've got a team of 40, well, 48 uh, scientists and volunteers and media on this particular leg. The expedition's been going for seven weeks now. The first two weeks were in the sub Antarctic New Zealand Islands, where we're doing a lot of work. And then the team rotated, and then another team came on for a second, working with colleagues and institutions around the world. Okay, and Andrew, sorry I interrupted you there. Do tell us, do tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, sure. I'm Andrew Peacock. I'm uh, an expedition medical doctor. So Chris kindly uh, invited me along to look after the health and safety of the team. Do this kind of thing a bit with regards to trips to places like the Arctic, Antarctica, and other areas of the world. And uh, I'm an adventure travel photographer as well. I've been contributing images to Lonely Planet for many years now, and uh, combining the two things together gives me um, a great opportunity to travel to different parts of the world, which is a lot of fun. Sure. I mean, this is a fascinating trip in any sure. circumstances, I mean, but, but you guys have gone through a particularly dramatic time. I just want to unravel the story a little bit. Andrew, I wonder if you, uh, the, 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 the ship got stuck in pack ice on Christmas Eve, I believe. Can you talk us through what happened, Andrew? Can you talk us through what happened, Andrew? Yeah, sure. We actually um, had pretty much wrapped up the the shore-based work that Chris and the other scientific team had been undertaking, and had um, come out of an open area of water, and we're just working our way through some pack ice. We were only about two nautical miles away from open water, and heading north to conduct just a few more scientific studies on our way home to our original bluff in New Zealand, uh, and the pack ice started. To become quite a bit thicker and the ship was moving a bit more slowly through that area and as it turned out a, a large area of old pack ice from well to the east of where we were, uh, unknown to us had broken out and pushed southeasterly winds and uh, eventually just came up the captain could do no more and were to just sit and wait out uh, the ice was going to prepare for us next and it wasn't long before there was suddenly 20 miles of ice between us and open water where our forward momentum stopped. So I believe the captain made uh, the distress call on Christmas Day. What was the what was the mood like when on board when people realised what was going on? Well, basically done the uh, we'd been doing work on the twenties and, and we'd basically stop. Um, Christmas Eve we'd stop and 
Uh, it was Christmas Day though. Um, I think we were still we were getting satellite information and advice from other people externally who still thought we had a good chance of maybe getting out ourselves. Um, so at the time, the thought was, you know, maybe a couple of days we might still break out. I mean, part of the reason, as Andrew mentioned, why the issue was so bad was not only it was the very thick old ice, but the lead of open water just closed down because the winds were pushing everything against us. Um, now that's a common feature in this part of the world. You've got a lot of low pressure systems going around the continent, and, and alongside the coastline, that they end up manifesting themselves as southeasterly winds. Uh, but now and again, you do get reversals, you get more southerly winds or even westerlies, and of course, that would have taken the pressure off enormously. So we were quietly hopeful that maybe a slight change in the pressure systems would have uh, opened up. So at the time, morale was quite good, and to be perfectly honest, morale, full stop, it held up really well. People were very good, looked out for each other, talked to each other all the time. We did lots of activities, we had twice daily briefings, um, and we just looked after each other. And after a while, I think people got quite philosophical. We, it's Antarctica. It was changing every few hours what might happen, and uh, sure. as a result, people just took it as it came. Sure. And on Christmas Day itself, I believe that you know <laughs> you, you observed itself, a few well, traditions. You kind of carried on as normal, right? Yeah, yeah, we had Christmas dinner, full trimmings. Uh, Father Christmas even found us. <laughs> yeah, and in spite of that, <laughs> incredibly, some of the guys still did some science as well, which was, uh, you know, it was an it was a stop we weren't looking for, but search the best they could in, in spite of the fact being Christmas Day which was a real dedication on their part. We had uh, a couple of fantastic uh, Kiwi chefs with us who did a great job of um, a brilliant, producing a brilliant Christmas dinner. Yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Meant yeah. to fill our home. <laughs> Just, just to listen. I'm just going to check the satellite. One a second. The ship's still moving around at Case, uh, off of Casey Station. The, the weather's pretty bad. Good. Weather's bad on land uh, enough that we can't get in to refuel and uh, resupply Casey at the moment. So the ship's just a figure of eight really, really around. Sort of. What are we? Ten k's offshore. Ten k's offshore. We've got these amazing tabular bergs all around us. And uh, it's just absolutely stunning, stunning uh, environment. This morning it was sunny. Uh, there was the, the, the snow in the distance, and we had a bit of snow earlier. But at the moment, it's uh, it's quite simple. Yesterday it was getting up to 50 knots, yeah, and it was, was nice. blowing a hoolie. Yep. Right, you're back. I just lost you for a moment there. Oh, sorry about that, and you too. That's all right. Um, so, uh, if I understand right. rightly, two icebreakers <laughs> tried to two to reach the Skalaski. Right. A Chinese ship and then an Australian ship, and they both didn't manage to get there. And that's when you kind of realise that you're going to be stuck there for a lot longer than you expected. What was the what was the that realisation like? What was that realisation? Well, it was one of these weird things because at one level um, people were very uh, philosophical. Um, I think we we started getting words as well at the time. People were taking it in this. I think people were dealing with it as it came. Um, and then we started getting reports that the world's media was watching us and, uh, and quite frankly we're still not quite sure what that means. We're, we're still living in a bit of a bubble at the moment so <laughs> we certainly did uh, a number of interviews and uh, it was a... Uh, right, but you're laughing. I have no idea what well, happened. It was certainly, it was certainly all over the news in the UK, like that's for sure. In a bubble, I think Andrew's <laughs> so, well, wow. Well, that's uh, it, it was a great way of linking out to people, and, and this sort of software and the technology of satellite, the Inversat system we're using, just allowed us to talk to people like you live. And of course, the, the benefit of being on the Shikalski on a stable platform meant we could uh, we could dial in almost any time, which was it was great to be able to tell family and friends were okay rather than just a press alert from someone else who wasn't on the ground. Sorry, I just cut, caught, caught the end of that there. What, Sorry, could you just caught, repeat yeah, that again? No, it was just having this technology on uh, the Shikalski where we were locked in sea ice meant we could just point the satellite almost any time of day and uh, and uh, connect up and talk to family and friends, at least through the media, telling them everyone was okay. And that was really important, and it was important to relay that back to the team to say to them, look, word is getting out, but we're okay. Absolutely, it is truly remarkable that we can we can speak to you now. Um, you were still stuck there on New Year's Eve. Um, how did you see in 2014? Oh, again, um, 
fairly drink with the, the bar was fully functioning Kowski through that, that period. Uh, beer was running a bit low, which was of concern to some of the people on board, I think. Uh, but we had a we had a fun New Year's Eve party. And, you know, clearly we were in a warm, comfortable ship. Uh, we had plenty of food. Uh, there was no real concern for safety in that sense. We weren't exposed to the weather. And um, I think, you know, while there was a bit of media interest in what was going on, clearly as a group of people, we weren't sitting out on the ice exposed, dealing with, you know, living in tents or anything like that. We had a stable, safe ship in which to, uh, in which to exist and, and we were prepared to wait things out. But once that initial rescue call had gone out because of some icebergs actually that were near us and there was concern that icebergs could impact upon the ship, then, then it was really out of our hands what happened next. The, the rescue... Uh, maritime authorities took charge and, and uh, we were just getting information from them as to what the options were going to be. Okay. And you were rescued by, by a helicopter in the end. I believe it's the helicopter from the Chinese ship which landed, picked you up and took you to the Aurora Australis. The pictures look absolutely incredible. Andrew, can you kind of describe what that experience was like? Yeah, well, the, the experience um, itself was all it was a bit dramatic in, in the way it happened so quickly. As Chris was saying earlier, we were having briefings twice a day, but the briefings were always different as to what our next options might be. Um, there was concern initially that once the call uh, we're going to go with the helicopter evacuation because neither ship can get close enough to us to break the ship free. Uh, then the issue was, of course, safety with regards to where the helicopter was going to land, first of all near us, and then uh, in terms of the Aurora Australis, we're actually standing on the heli deck, which you can't see very well behind us, but the heli deck here the, was not large enough for the Chinese helicopter, and so then it became an issue of finding an ice flow near the Aurora that they were all happy with that we can land on. Um, it, and and as a result, things really quickly. The, yeah. the helicopter came initially to do a quick uh, reconnaissance of the area where we had marked out a helipad with some Milo. By the way, I'm not sure if that story came through. There was a note that I filed that the, the H clearly marked on the ice. We okay. had uh, nine tins of Milo that went into that. So we didn't know what Milo is. Well, <laughs> um, no, 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 no. Um, you know, just on top of that, basically. Uh, and in terms of photographically, I had agreed to file uh, six images exclusively to AP, which was something that had sort of been worked out a couple of days before. And I was on the helicopter flight. They wanted the images uploaded of the first helicopter load of people, and um, they wanted that done before I left the ship. So there was um, so I needed to think through and have sorted out before that all happened. And it, it, luckily, it all went well. The, the team were amazing. The Chinese yeah. uh, helicopter crew were extraordinary. They were turning people around in the groups within 25 minutes. I mean, it worked so professionally between the Chinese and Australians. We just can't thank them enough for what they did. They're, they were remarkable. I mean, the conditions were stable at the time. It was ideal flying conditions, but fortunately, that iceberg threat had retreated at the time. Mm. Uh, there was always a chance, of course, that Shikowsky could break out, which it, it fortunately has done now. With the, but at the time, the uh, we had the discussion it was, look, if we say we stay and an iceberg hits us, that would be a bad cause. And the captain made that call, so we went with it. That's incredible. I, mean, I just want to pick up on, on one element of that. Andrew, as well as obviously being a medical doctor, you're, you're a very seasoned adventurer and you're a, you're a professional photographer for learning. Just lost you there, James, so we'll see hopefully come back. Hi James, can you hear us? No. That was fun. It's amazing technology. Hang on, I will just Yeah, just check. Hi guys, are you back? Hi guys, you back? Uh yeah, Chris is trying to check the uh, the satellite, but obviously oh, you there? Yeah, I'm there. Sorry about that. I just uh, lost you. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. OK, that's all right. Yeah, Andrew, I was asking yeah. you a question. As I, I probably said earlier, yeah, um, you're a medical doctor, you're a very seasoned adventurer, but you're also a professional uh, photographer. Uh, um, and one of the questions that we have from our community, from Rod, Roger Beckiers, is how do you keep a camera working in, in extreme conditions like you, like you experienced in Antarctica? 
Yeah, a lot of people ask those sorts of questions when they hear that, that uh, I'm coming into this part of the world. Interestingly, the I, I use Canon um, uh, a, a Canon uh, 5D3, which is a fairly weather sealed camera, and those sorts of level of cameras really don't have too many troubles. Uh, I mainly look after the batteries. That's where you're going to run into trouble in terms of keeping batteries warm and keeping the power to the camera. And that's relatively easy to do by having a spare set in a down jacket pocket or something like that. Other than that, the camera performs it's much more likely that I am going to perform better with cold hands and, and I have yet to find gloves that I'm really happy with that I'm happy to hold a metal camera with and operate that um, for me to do so with dexterity. So I tend to end up with things that are very cold as a result. Well, there's another question that we've also had in from D. Michelle, uh, which which relates to this. Is there anything you have to do to keep warm? Anything special? Do you go out and do a special exercise on deck, or do you just basically common sense and wrap up in thermal clothing and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, no, very much it's about common sense. Uh, anyone contemplating coming down to Antarctica on any kind of journey does need to put a bit of it into sorting out uh, the correct clothing kit. And, um, you know, a layering system is the, the, the thing that we talked about even in briefing with all the crew. Uh, we've got down jackets on at the moment. After that, I, I wear a, um, a merino wool clothing from a company in Australia. Um, you know, they make great stuff and uh, there are, there are um, options out there for just getting a simple layer in place so that you can stay warm, uh, wool or polypropylene underneath and then piece and then down. It's, it's relatively warm moment. we're in the lee of the wind and it's not too bad. I mean, it's heat management, it's, it's bizarre actually, here it's, it's actually quite easy to overheat and dehydrate so the big thing is uh, managing that level when you're almost too warm so don't don't put on lots of heavy layers first of all and then you're doing strenuous exercise because when you stop of course freeze this and that's when your core temperature drops so a lot of it's just managing that heat I mean the equipment and technology and gear we've got today is brilliant I mean frostbite is really shouldn't really be an issue mm -hmm. it should be fine Antarctica is a, is a place that um and fantasize a lot about the lonely planet and um, it's on a lot of people's bucket lists as their ultimate destination. What would you what would you say to people they should expect from a visit there? What is so special about it? Oh, it, it, I, it, it's very much cliches but it, it is a blitz on the sense of here. It's a brilliance of white. When you first come down here you see your first penguins or the wind's not blowing, the stillness is incredible. They just, out, it, you feel so remote. It, it's almost Martian sometimes when you're wandering around and you're 100 kilometers from anyone. And uh, there's no smell. You're, you're out there and you're in an environment where you can't even smell the moisture in the air. And it's just, it's just dizzying. Where, where you go to this environment, you, you feel a real sense of the environment getting connected and the level that I've never found anywhere else on the planet. Just, just a word, James, on that. Photographically, um, for boat or ship-based journeys, which for people would be looking at in terms of visiting Antarctica, it's going to be mostly on um, uh, ships with regards to travel to the Antarctic Peninsula, like that. And the first thing that's really clearly very different is the virtually 24-hour daylight. Mm. Um, and you can you can really struggle in those first few days to see and uh, look at and photograph. Find yourself suddenly running 23 hours. Not knowing where to sleep, and there's another iceberg going past your, your porthole window, and you rush out to figure out that or have a look at that. And it, there's just um, it, it's a very different environment, and it's beautiful. For sure, it sounds incredible. Are there any particular tips that you'd have for travellers in terms of you know something unexpected that they might want to pack if they were going to go? Um, anything unexpected? Uh, we talked about clothes. Really important. Photographically, make sure you've got enough memory. Let's bring your laptop or your tablet or something. You can download images and look at them. Um, it, it, well, even things like um, satellite phones. Uh, I mean, it's, it looks a bit like a brick. It feels a bit like a brick, but it's a fantastic way of keeping in contact with family and friends. You can send Twitter feeds throughout and let people know what you're doing. And those sort of communications nowadays are just they're just brilliant. You can share the environment with you with other people, a bit like what we're doing today. And, and I think that's a lovely thing that you can do. I mean, a hundred years ago, those guys were using the first radio systems to communicate, make the first documentaries. Now we can use satellite technology and take people with you. I 
mean, gosh, if, if you want to come down here and, and get involved, it's, it's not just for holidays, the tourists, you know, there's fantastic science to be done out here. And there's a lot of groups working out looking for volunteers to uh, help and support. Down down here. Am I right in saying that most most tours would go to most tours with members of the public on them would go to a different part of Antarctica to the one that you've been been exploring? Yeah, 90, 98, 99 percent of people that visit Antarctica do so uh, on the Arctic Peninsula, which is accessed far more easily where we are. We've taken eight or nine days to come from the tip of the South Island island to make it down to the East Antarctic area that, that we visited, whereas from Ushuaia at the, um, at the tip of South America, you can get across the Drake Passage in two or three or four days, depending on weather, and access Antarctica on a ship that way. You can even and, fly, actually, yeah. from South America. So, yeah, there are options, and it is a lot easier as a result. So most people do end up going down there, and there are many companies run very good uh, ship-based tours in that region, maybe nine or ten days long. Uh, or up to two weeks, perhaps, depending on where they go. And, and the wildlife and the scenery is spectacular in that region. It's, mm. it's really, uh, it's mountainous, and the waters, once you reach the area, are calm. So, in terms of those, in terms of being worried about sea sickness, that sort of thing, you, you may have to put up with some rough seas for a day or two. But once yeah. you're actually along the Antarctic Peninsula, yeah. you're going to have you're going to have good conditions. And you mentioned wildlife there. Do, have you guys encountered uh, anything you guys on the trip? I was encountered stuff, but anything in particular? A couple of penguins. <laughs> it's, it's extraordinary. Even when you're locked in sea ice, penguins fall. But, I mean, the ones that we were seeing most of all were Adili penguins, which are gorgeous, are about 30 centimetres high. Uh, they waddle along, they're all characters. Yeah. Uh, they come and look at you positively. They'll stand around as a group, uh, waddle along. They'll, they'll, they'll uh, go down their stomachs and uh, cruise along the ice. Um, when you're on the edge of a ice, there'll be a group of them, and they'll all just be standing or sleeping idly, and then suddenly another group will be swimming past, and they'll come up to the sea ice edge and sort of almost harangue them to tell them to go away and then they'll go back to standing on their own. Uh, so a lot of it still some emperors as well and actually we were doing a hangout on there a few weeks ago and we were all this and then suddenly an orca, a killer whale, came into view and we caught it on film, you know, uh, wow. blowing uh, to an air and, wow. and and that was just spectacular. That was a yeah. magical moment that really was and, and gosh, Antarctica for wildlife. It, yeah, it sounds absolutely incredible. Just stunning. I'm sure a lot of people watch. If you can't be down here, you've got to come. Yeah. I've got a question from Twitter from Anna Gravers. I think it's Gravers. Uh, she's asking, what would you say are the biggest opportunities and threats for Antarctica in the coming years? Just say that again. Did you catch that exactly? Just what would you say are the biggest opportunities and threats for Antarctica in the coming years? Threats for Antarctica in the coming years. Well, that's an interesting. Certainly, um, from a, a, a climate change view, as uh, we're seeing big shift in the winds coming south, um, and that's driving a lot of warming along Calaris. So there's a threat of uh, destabilization of a lot of the ice, uh, with uh, the risk of sea level rise. Um, that's a that's an issue over the next century for sure. There's always a lot of uh, mine um, and exploitable resources, but fortunately at the moment it's locked down with the Antarctic Treaty under something called the Madrid Protocol. Um, and that's uh, that's something that the international have so far stopped and are looking to maintain. And, um, I think those are the biggest issues. Yeah, certainly um, IATO, the international the, the controls the tourism ships to the area has issues with regards to the impact on wildlife and slightly make land for the peninsula and other areas. So there's been a lot of thought and a lot of um, no, is, yes. a lot of involvement by a number of bodies in controlling various uh, aspects of impact. Yeah, the standards are incredibly high, which is really reassuring when you're out here. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're speaking to us now from Casey Station, which is a, a permanent base in Australian Antarctic Territory. You're still a very long way from home. When do you expect to see your families? We're hoping to be back in Hobart somewhere between the 20th or 22nd. That's the plan at the moment. Uh, much, 
but with Antarctica being Antarctica, it's based on uh, the guys here have got to finish their resupply. Uh, this is what's known as Voyage 2-3, so uh, they've still got to finish off a resupply that they were halfway through uh, when they very kindly came to help us. So uh, they've got to finish that, and it's very dependent on weather. This this area, much like a lot of East Antarctica, is very vulnerable to these um, East uh, catabatic winds, which are really cold, dense winds are still on the plateau, and basically periodically will start opening the freezer door, and they'll pour out at uh, the normal speeds. Uh, certainly experienced them at Cape Town when he was here, and, at average wind speeds of 70 kilometers now got up to 200 kilometers now so they're nothing like that high here at the moment but they have to get a good window of weather but they can then actually still uh, finish a resupply so at the moment weather forecast isn't too bad it's looking quite good so hopefully 20 seconds Hello, can you hear me, guys? Hello, I've got you back now. I just missed you. You were talking about the wind uh, coming out the Antarctic uh, plane. Yeah, the uh, the catabatic winds. So, uh, uh, this particular part that very sits on the plateau. Periodically, they they'll start off go down to the coast, and uh, never quite sure when they're going to blow. Uh, the the modelling is really quite good now for predicting precise uh, the forecast. Is Looking quite good. It's a bit like opening a freezer door, they'll just pour out and they can reach up to speeds of 10 kilometers. Forces team experience kind of winds of 70 kilometers now, gusting up to 200. We don't get anything like that at Casey, fortunately, but they need a decent length of time where the winds aren't blowing so they can finish the resupply. Right. And I believe the Skolaski is now free from the ice. We've got a question from Nicholas Stewart. Um, when, is it going to beat you back home? Is it going to beat you? The, the Schakowsky is the pronunciation. Um, well, it, it may well get to bluff before we get to Hobart, that's true. Uh, just the way it is, which is great. It's great that it's got out of the ice. Um, as Chris said before, the, the Chinese breaker and their helicopter crew did a fantastic job getting us off that ship. And then Aurora Australis, Australian Antarctic Division, have been fantastic in uh, getting us aboard their ship and making us work. And, um, and we're happy to be with them and get back to Hobart when we get there. But yeah, there is a chance that might happen. That's sure. just the way it goes with Antarctica. But. Sure. Um, where can people sure. find out more information uh, about the expedition itself? Oh, if people would like to learn more, please visit our, our website, spiritwatson.com. Um, and we're on various media under the name Twitter at Prof. Chris Turney. And you can get the updated about walking as we go, but science work is continuing and uh, we're looking forward to putting this work out there as uh, quickly as we can. Okay. There's also uh, a couple of galleries on the National Geographic website, okay. James, that people could uh, search for as well from images from, from prior to the event of being, uh, of being stuck in the ice. There's some images there from the expedition, the science and the wildlife and the landscape uh, that National Geographic have put up, which is great. Great. Well, we must check out those. Well, it just leaves me to say thank you very much on behalf of Lonely Planet. It's been a, a real privilege to be able to talk to you, um, and we wish you a safe onward journey to Tasmania. We wish you a safe onward to Tasmania. Thanks, James. All the best. Everyone at home. Bye. Cheers. Bye bye.